registered dietitian in private practice in Portland, Maine, and I help patients with digestive health issues. Uh, I'm here today because of the book I wrote a few years ago called IBS Free at Last that introduced a new type of diet uh, to Americans uh, that is about 75% likely to help IBS sufferers with their symptoms. And I invited Lauren to join me today because we met through Facebook after she read the book. So why is this topic so important? Why did you have to write this book? Well, I kind of felt like somebody needed to break the silence about IBS, uh, also known as irritable bowel syndrome. Not really a convenient or congenial break room topic, but it does affect 15 to 20% of Americans, 15 to 20% of the people in this room. That's probably about 40 million people just in, in the United States alone. And it's the second leading cause of work absenteeism. You know, that's the kind of impact it has. And not only does it have a big economic impact, but it has a huge personal impact on quality of life. Uh, you know, for some people, sure, maybe it's a nuisance. But for other people, it's a serious enough condition to cost them their jobs, their relationships, and their ability to be the, the active, healthy people they want to be. And is this why we don't hear a, not a lot about IBS? Because it's sort of like a, you know, it's not an easy topic yeah. to talk about. Yep, that's a big part of it. Also, for, you know, most of uh, the past 20 years, there really haven't, or even 30 years, there haven't really been effective treatments for IBS. You know, patients tended to seek medical care frequently for it, but the only thing that doctors and nutritionists really had to offer was high fiber diet, eat more fiber, eat more fiber. And it turns out that really is not effective for, for many people with IBS. So we really needed something new. And the, the book that you wrote and, and the book that, we, that I read that helped me so much, um, why did you write the book? Did you take, it was it because of all this or what was pushing you forward with that? Well, it was a little bit of a, a journey. Uh, I've had ulcerative colitis since 1985, so I've always been really tuned into anything to do with nutrition and digestive health. So when I attended a conference in 2007 where the subject of FODMAPs was, you know, just mentioned in passing, I latched onto it immediately and, you know, tried to find out everything I could. I asked Dr. Google. Oh, um, what did Dr. Google say? <laughs> Dr. Not Google much. said. <laughs> Dr. Google said that there was this great new idea that they were uh, using in a research setting in Australia, and yet there were no patient tools that were created, no materials in writing for us here in America. So I created some to use in my own practice with my own patients, and when I found out how effective the diet was, I knew you know, I had to get it out there. And it was in the early days of print-on-demand publishing um, I self-published the book because, as some of you probably know, it can be a very long process to go the traditional publishing route, and I really didn't want people to have to wait another minute. Uh, so I put the book out there, and uh, it's, it's done very well. Uh, Excellent. And how do you think that social media has affected how people look at this diet? I mean, we have to talk about what it is exactly, but right. how did social media help through the process? Well, you know, it's interesting because 10, 15 years ago, if you had a condition like IBS, if your own personal doctor didn't know how to help you, you were just, you know what, out of luck. Yeah. Um, but now, every patient with a computer has access to, you know, reading the original research about a condition, going directly to healthcare providers who are experts in that condition, uh, communicating with other patients, and so it, it completely has changed the game when it comes to the adoption of a new diet like this. I'd say that in many cases, the patients or uh, clients are out there ahead of their doctors and nutritionists when it comes to you know, wanting to learn more about the low FODMAP diet. And I think in my case, that's exactly right. I mean, I got a little sheet that said, okay, this is from about.com, eat this and don't eat this, but 
it didn't leave me with a, yeah. enough. So right. we keep using the term FODMAP, 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 FODMAP. FODMAP. <laughs> What is it? Okay, I have just a couple slides so that you, you too will know what FODMAPs are. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are curious about words, uh, the acronym FODMAP stands for fermentable oligo, dye, and monosaccharides and polyols. But I always tell my patients, you know, it, it's not so important what the acronym stands for, but to understand that it refers to certain sugars and fibers in the diet that are capable of causing uh, IBS symptoms, including gas, uh, diarrhea, constipation, and abdominal pain uh, for people that have IBS. Oh, too fast. So these are a few of the foods that contain FODMAPs, and I think it's kind of a shock at first for people to realize that a lot of the healthy foods they've been advised to eat for a long time uh, actually can be too much of a good thing. Uh, FODMAPs are found um, as lactose in certain milk products. Fructose or fruit sugar is present in all fruits as well as some other sweeteners like honey and agave, uh, as well as high fructose corn syrup. Uh, the gluten grains happen to also be sources of FODMAPs. So I think, as a little aside to the earlier gluten presentation, I think sometimes when people do feel better on a gluten-free diet, at least around their gut symptoms, it's really because they're also eating a diet that's lower in FODMAPs. Uh, and then we, we also find uh, some sugar alcohols in certain fruits and vegetables. Uh, onions and garlic are big sources of FODMAPs, and so are legumes and certain soy products. So another important thing to understand about FODMAPs is that it's a really big picture view. We're not looking at just lactose or just fructose. We're trying to look at the big picture because all of these FODMAPs go into the same bucket. You're the bucket. And uh, it's really the, the load of FODMAPs over a particular meal or a particular day that cause the symptoms, not one individual food. So I think that um, a good example of, of how that comes into play is the fact that a lot of people can't really figure out if they're lactose intolerant or not. You know, they seem to do okay with milk and milk products sometimes, but not other times. Why is that? And I believe that the one reason for that is that on the day that you tolerated the ice cream for dessert just fine, that might not have been a day when you happened to have had a couple of apples and pizza and you know a big bagel for breakfast and so on. So you had plenty of room in your bucket to tolerate that lactose. But on the day when you had a problem with the milkshake or the ice cream at the end of a long day of eating, uh, you may have just been full to the brim with, with uh, FODMAPs, and the ice cream was just the last straw that caused you to have symptoms. And the other interesting thing is those symptoms are usually delayed. Right. So, That's why it's so if funny. you, you know, eat a lot of FODMAPs the night before, you might not really be aware of the problems that are going to result from it until the next morning. And I, so, this slide... That just got away. <laughs> Oh, well, that's okay. So when somebody wants to try a, to find out whether FODMAPs play a role in their symptoms, um, I recommend a dietary experiment. And um, I ask them to limit all the FODMAPs in their diet for a few weeks. If they feel much better, uh, then we know we're on to something. And at that point, we start a process of reintroducing the FODMAPs in a kind of organized way according to a plan. And in so doing, we, we can find out what the worst troublemakers are and figure out how to go on from there. Uh, and our goal is really to have people eating the most nutritious, liberal diet they can tolerate. Sounds great. So Lauren, can you tell us a little bit about your story? Sure. Um, I've had or been diagnosed or not diagnosed with IBS for at least 22 years. And one of the most difficult things as people with IBS know is that it's usually not a positive. You have IBS, but you don't have celiacs, you don't have this, you don't have colitis, you don't have Crohn's, you don't have all these other things. Okay, 
You have IBS. It must be IBS. So when it must be IBS, there's really nothing to do with it. And it can be very difficult to talk about. It's not a socially appropriate kind of thing. I'm like, how many times did you go to the bathroom today? Or you know, <laughs> what, what's bothering your stomach this minute? And why are you running out of my classroom like that? But it's real. And I, I mean, Jeffrey is my brother. You could see the, the resemblance. And I have had a weight issue much different than Jeffrey's journey. But I was at a point where um, nobody could figure out why I couldn't lose some of the weight that I needed to. And yes, I still have a lot to lose, but 50 pounds are gone, but I couldn't get that off. And I went to every doctor. I went to the, you know, the gynecologist and the nutritionist, and I went to the, to the GI, and I went to an endocrinologist, and they're all like, you're fine, you're healthy, your bloods are great, everything's great. But I couldn't lose any weight. So the GI doctor had suggested um, surgery, and I started to cry because I felt like that's not an answer for me. And he said, there's one thing I just learned about at a conference just a couple weeks ago, and it was this diet. He knew nothing about it except for this little list from about.com. You can eat this, this, and this, and don't ever eat this and this and this. And I was like, oh, okay. And I took the diet to my nutritionist, who was kind enough to come with me to Whole Foods. And we went through Whole Foods, and she showed me what millet was, because I didn't, never saw millet before. I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how to read a label for the kinds of things I was looking for. And lo and behold, after two weeks and having your book, I think your book arrived three days into my search, I was better. It took three days. Now, it was this diet isn't really designed to be a weight loss diet per no, se. No, not at how all. How did it help you? For me, what it, my weight. biggest thing was that, you know, you eat healthy. So you're going to have salads yeah. and you're going to have fresh vegetables and fruit and all this great stuff. And I would eat that for three days and I would be so sick you couldn't talk to me. I mean, and I'm talking mm -hmm. sick like, don't come in my room and, and don't talk to me and let me sleep for three days because I have to sleep off the effects of whatever had happened. And it turned out that this wonderful healthy salad I had had more onion in it than my body could ever tolerate. And I never would have taken the onion out of my salad because it's onion. Like, why is it going to do anything? The croutons were gone, but the onions were still there. And then the fruit was the same thing. I love watermelon, but watermelon I can't tolerate. And I didn't know to pull those things back. So once the onions were out of my life and, and the garlic was taken away and the, and the broccoli right then and there, I lost 30 pounds of bloat. It wasn't really even weight. It's just my stomach was so distended from so many years of eating this food that fermented and fermented and fermented that it just sort of settled down. Mm -hmm. And it's still a process and there are good days and there are bad days, but since May of 2012, I can say, that I can count on my hands the number of times I'm sick as opposed to counting on my hands the number of days that I'm well. And it's, for me, it's a tribute to you and what you've been able to take in your book and make understandable. You took the science and the nutrition and you gave it to me to the point I can give it to my friends and I can share the information because just like Jeff might not be eating gluten, you know, we fight all the time. It's gluten-free, eat it, and I'll say, but it's not. I'm not free, I can't eat it, it has inulin in it, it has this in it, because it's not the same thing, and this understanding of respect for each other and where our, where our intolerances are has been a huge growth for all of us. I think the bloating is an oh. aspect of IBS that really bothers a lot of people. I had a client last week who I had previously asked, you know, do you experience bloating, and she said, I, I, I don't know. When I saw her last week, she said, oh my gosh, I never even knew how right. bloated I was. I had no clue. Now I realize that you know, because the FODMAPs aren't so high in her diet anymore, the bacteria in her gut are not fermenting and producing as much gas, and fluid is not getting pulled into her gut by these FODMAPs, and she finally knows what it feels like to feel normal. It's huge, yeah. and it's thanks to you, and for all of your social media people out there, it's really thanks to social media that Patsy and I were able to connect. You know, I wrote a recommend, uh, what did I do, write a review on you Amazon. Wrote a review on Amazon. And then I started to, you know, ask questions, and because of all that back and forth, we're sitting here today, so. Exactly. It does help, and it for does. the doctors who aren't sure if it works, it works, and if, mm -hmm. you know, you never need any real life information. Patsy is very reachable and easy to talk to, so. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for it.